Ouch! You bullhead! I wish that Freddy Krueger would come. Daddy, no, make him go away! Make him go away, please! Response <laughs> to people connected to Trump who have not been complying has been at a very slow, careful, sensitive pace. Take two of Trump's former White House aides who refused to comply with lawful subpoenas, Bannon and Navarro. Well, they've had plenty of time. Bannon had weeks between refusing to comply and being held in contempt, another month until he was indicted in November. And even in a dispute over noncompliance, I want you to understand, legally, the Justice Department still arranged to give Mr. Bannon the opportunity to come in voluntarily, which he did. Now, Peter Navarro spoke openly about his efforts to overthrow the election, which brought legal scrutiny on him. He put out a book. He did interviews. Only after all that did Congress subpoena him in February. Then, when he did not comply, he was held in contempt in April and indicted months later in June. Now, after all that, unlike Bannon, the DOJ did not try, perhaps because they are not naive, they did not try to get him to come in voluntarily. Similar to the legal process for Trump, where you have to go to a judge, the DOJ determined Navarro was not legally trustworthy. That's not an opinion. There's actually a standard for that. So they asked a judge to approve what was the less intrusive approach. And that left Mr. Navarro outraged, rattled, and seemingly experiencing something that he did not think could happen to him. Former advisor Peter Navarro is at this hour in federal custody. He was issued a subpoena in February to produce documents and appear before the committee in March, but refused to do either. What did they do? They intercepted me getting on the plane. And then they put me in handcuffs. They bring me here. They put me in leg irons. They stick me in a cell. That's punitive. That, that what they did to me today violated the Constitution. They did put him in handcuffs. Handcuffs are part of getting arrested, just like going into the cell before an arraignment. Now, Mr. Navarro then went on Fox News with those same complaints I just showed you, which is the same place where viewers had been lectured so many times on how to avoid exactly those problems with police. Just say, yes, sir, yes, officer, and comply. If, in fact, a police officer gives you a command, please exit the car, you should say, yes, officer, no officer, okay, officer. Ah, That's not how Navarro sounded when dealing with law enforcement or the officers of the subpoena, nor Bannon, nor Trump, who's going well beyond the Hannity standard of yes, officer, and currently threatening retaliation. But you could say, right. What's the context? What's the history? Those clips are from those reactions to police incidents with black Americans. So let's get into it. Some of what I showed you was the reaction to when an unarmed man, Walter Scott, was running away from an officer who shot him in the back and killed him. That was found to be illegal force because it was secretly caught on tape. Otherwise, we'd never know about it. Many critics still assailed Mr. Scott, seen there not posing a threat, for not complying. He's dead. Many times police use force even when people are seen complying. Terrence Crutcher had his hands clearly above his head, surrounded by officers and a cop car. When an officer still shot and killed him, that officer was acquitted. Now we're hearing talk about how agents searched Donald Trump's home under a warrant or how they executed that arrest warrant for Mr. Navarro. Now, remember, it was a no knock warrant, which is not the least intrusive means that was used in an operation that led to the police shooting a hospital EMT, Breonna Taylor, shooting her to death while she was asleep. 
that operation did not afford her a chance to comply. Or take a recent case involving Mr. Jacob Blake. Now, he had not complied with an arrest warrant. So that's what we could call Peter Navarro territory. But when police approached, he was not ever seen threatening or attacking. He was documented walking away. And that's when police shot him in the back seven times, paralyzing him. A rush to use force in this disturbing scene. We are not showing the entire video under our standards and practices. Now, every example is not the same, but some of the commentators are. We just showed you Trump ally and lawyer Lindsey Graham, who actually recently blew through and did not comply with an ordered court appearance in Georgia. We'll see if he eventually shows up. Now, in this report, we showed him insinuating that a, quote, gentleman should have complied should have yielded when asked. I just showed you, Mr. Blake, that was Senator Graham talking specifically about Jacob Blake. I don't know why the gentleman did yield when he was asked to yield. He didn't yield when he was asked to yield, Mr. Graham says in response to the shooting. That's the wrong answer legally. Graham, a lawyer, knows it is illegal for police to use lethal force on a person simply because the person's fleeing. Resisting arrest is illegal, so is speeding, so is tax evasion. I could read you a lot of laws. Those things in America under the law and Supreme Court precedent are not punishable by a shooting or a summary execution. So the hypocrisy and the double standard here matters. It is political and it is racial. And the point is not that police should be using even more force against whomever suspects. The point is, today's right-wing politics and a very long strain of white supremacy in America views police as the muscle for that supremacist power structure. And it does not view police as stewards of independent fairness or accountability for all. It is a thuggish, authoritarian, and supremacist mentality. And it predates Trump, though he tapped into it and has helped animate it and make it worse. But that also means, according to what we know, it would likely endure well past the Trump era or any single politician. Now, they don't always teach this in school. So consider class in session here on the news tonight. Ibram Kendi has documented this wider history where many Americans may genuinely but mistakenly believe police violence is caused by just a lack of compliance rather than the violent remnants of slavery. And this is about facts and data, which show that American police escalate interactions on a racial basis. Police use more aggressive and less respectful approaches to black Americans in traffic stops, which are a very common first order interaction between random people and police. And also, police use more respectful and de-escalating approaches with a majority of white Americans in the same stops. Data shows police sometimes even apologize for having to do the stop or the interaction at all, and that data overlaps with class discrimination. Yvonne Abraham writes in the Boston Globe that when you tie it together, for many conservatives, blue lives mattered only when they were policing black ones. So a lot of this is interrelated. And if it sounds hard to hear for some people who feel like they want to support police or at least the honest police or think better of America, I get it. I hear you. There's facts and emotion. The emotion you have for the officer down the block or someone you had a good interaction with or how you want America to be, that's understandable emotion. I get it. But I'm here reporting the facts for you. And the history of white supremacist violence and the way it relates to our current moment is a fact. So it's one that needs to be dealt with. There's more than one implication. For the lives of many real people, the less intrusive measures that, that were used in these examples to search Donald Trump or to peacefully arrest Steve Bannon, they can actually be deployed more often, more uniformly, and more fairly. And that's quite true, literally, as a matter of law and policing. If the innocent Breonna Taylor had been policed 
under the standard used for the guilty Steve Bannon, she would be alive today. And when I say guilty, I'm referring to his conviction, not an opinion. Just use the convicted Bannon standard and she'd be alive. If the unarmed, no threat Walter Scott had been later apprehended by the standard used for the indicted, not complying Mr. Navarro, then Mr. Scott would be peacefully apprehended in handcuffs for a day in court, not shot in the back. The list goes on. And I can tell you, as a legal reporter and lawyer, it is a very long list. I'm not going to go through all of it tonight. This is about the type of policing which impacts the largest number of Americans. If you just made those changes, if you just afforded what I refer legally to as the convicted Bannon standard for those other people, many of them innocent. Then another key implication goes to the empty core of this right wing project. And that's the effort to control and corrupt any prospect of equal justice under the law in America. It is an effort to use or get law enforcement to be used as a tool of white supremacy and right wing political persecution. Lock her up. Now that campaign is bad for most Americans. It undermines public safety. It is undemocratic. And it is also very bad for honest police because honest police officers don't want to be pulled into that political racial project. So when you hear a right wing politicized framework about compliance, which you may when the subjects turn and there's a debate about a different incident that doesn't involve them and their heroes, know that that framework is mostly crap and a trick and that some of the people peddling it also know that while others may just be repeating what they hear. The law requires compliance, but it does not mandate injury, let alone murder, to achieve compliance. And so it may seem sometimes like everything runs together and we live in a mediated environment where you can link almost anything. But these are not links we're drawing in observation. These are the roots of the justice system. And for people who care about justice and want the system to better pursue it, these are pieces of history, of violence, of state violence, of state murder that we have been working on for a very long time. And if you think it feels hopeless, you have to remember the reason that so many people lie about the justice system is that even they in their cynicism know the truth can still matter. They seem to think if enough people knew the truth, maybe their efforts wouldn't work as well. So they keep lying to you. Don't let them get away with it. Keep your eye on the ball and on these facts, because justice is still possible.